even the largest organizations out there, you know, the, the Pfizer, the global payments, like they, they still have trouble with allocating resources to yeah. manage their entire portfolio, you know, so you certainly have to pick and choose your battles at a certain yeah. point. Hey everybody had a great episode today with Sebastian Biles talking about innovations and payments. Unfortunately, uh, Patty Murphy wasn't available today to join me. And so I did this one solo, um, but we covered some fantastic information towards the end of the interview. We get into chat GPT and AI and all of this and talk about how it's going to impact payments. And so uh, Sebastian and I had more of a kind of an in-depth conversation of what the future could look like. But then I go right into a questions from the field, like an extended version, and I literally talk you through, or if you're watching the video version, I show you how you can use ChatGPT to grow your payment processing portfolio. I give you three really practical, simple things that you can do to make your dramatically uh, you know, more efficient with your time and grow your portfolio. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. Um, now, uh, before I dive in today, let me uh, clarify here that neither Sebastian or Arkham has ever paid me for uh, consulting or advertising or anything like that. And also ChatGPT, as much as I'm promoting them in this episode, because I think it's so efficient for our industry, in no way do I have any kind of a advertising relationship or beneficial relationship with that company. I'm just promoting it because I think it is fantastic. So um, my name is James Shepard. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this episode of the Merchant Sales Podcast. Let's dive into our interview today with Sebastian Biles. Hey, everybody. I'm here today with my good friend, Sebastian Biles. How are you doing today, Sebastian? Pretty good, James. Pretty good. Good to be back. Today, Sebastian and I are going to be talking about innovation in payments. We're going to cover a wide range of topics, but I wanted to start out today by having Sebastian explain a little bit more about his journey. And so, Sebastian, like, tell us how you get into this crazy industry, and then also about Arkham. Dive in a little bit more detail and tell us more about how Arkham works um, and this journey that you've had of trying to improve attrition. Absolutely. So I kind of always like to dive in in terms of um, getting my strides in data uh, from grad school. So I went to grad school, applied master's program. And this is really, 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 really where I got the data bug from and, and ultimately, you know, learn how to leverage data and, and other and other techniques, right, in terms of st statistical modeling to really solve business issues. Um, shortly out of grad school, I went to work for you know a large consulting firm where we helped publication companies reduce subscriber churn you know so this is right around the turn where you know subscription revenue is the majority of the revenue that publication right. companies generate so that protection of that you know of that subscriber base essentially became of most important for for publication companies since a lot of that you know revenue that was driven through um through advertisement on the print side start to dry up, right? So, so newspapers got really smart maybe some five, 10 years ago in terms of how can we leverage analytics to really drive or maximize yield per subscriber while at the same time, you know, taking key or taking into consideration things like customer churn, right? The, right. the moment you raise rates along a certain subscriber base, that's the moment that you start seeing um, an increase or a spike in churn um, associated as well. So I did that and and really got to learn specifically how to hone in my skill set in terms of applying it into a business context where we have actual real world data and we're applying it and seeing results uh, on an almost real time basis. Um, fast forward, I ended up getting a job at Evil Payments, and there is really where I got my feet wet as as it came to uh, merchant acquiring specifically payments processor with you know a large acquire. And, and in there, that was uh, probably, you know, a, a crash co course on, 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 on Payments 101, right? I mean, this is right. the team that essentially took um, Global Payments public. Um, so I was, you know, benefited from being in the same room and the same office, essentially, as a lot of these, you know, decision makers who have had, you know, ample of experience, not only, you know, growing a merchant portfolio, but also even taking one of these companies public, Um so from there, you know, what my jobs was, you know, portfolio analysis and really seeing um, what sort of margins across our different markets and, and really helping manage or provide some visibility into that portfolio. Well, during my tenure there, I, I learned that, you know, hey, um, customers are also leaving their payments process, very similar to, you know, how they were leaving the publication companies. Right. Um, so I just put two and two together and realized, hey, uh, a lot of the methodologies and, and and tech that we're using in the publication industry can really be applied here in the payment sector. 
um, especially given that the fact that the ROI is significantly higher behind saving one merchant versus maybe saving one subscriber. Right. And at the same time, the quality of that you find in payments data, it's really unparalleled to anything else we've ever seen. Um, so we decided to, hey, you know, let, let's take this a shot. Let's give this a shot. And, you know, maybe fast forward a couple of years later. And, and we were essentially productizing this algorithm that that was created or or, or, or essentially, you know, experimented through that evil portfolio right since then we have you know obviously expanded in terms of our scope and and our ability to 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 really get those you know accuracy metrics hmm. up and at the same time provide enough time in advance um for, for our customers to engage that merchant that might have been flagged and give them enough time to actually retain them right um so nowadays we work with you know five retail wholesale isos um, we've analyzed hundreds of thousands of merchants up to this point. And, you know, we really help save um, a significant portion of net revenue uh, from ISOs that we've been working with us, right? Our, our whole our whole company is built around the hypothesis that, hey, you know, it, it doesn't matter why your merchants are leaving, right? You can always do something about it, whether it's a pricing related issue, whether it's an agent related issue, or maybe even a product related issue. The, these are all problems that drive voluntary attrition. And, and given that they're voluntary, uh, the, the essence of that attrition is voluntary. That means that something could be done and, and we could address that attrition, right? So our entire you know business is predicated around that hypothesis where if you know who's leaving, you know why they're leaving, you know how important that relationship is, then you can assign or allocate resources necessary to save that particular relationship, right? And 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 get rid of this, you know, high attrition rates that we see across the industry because that's just a, you know, almost a sign that hey, something is inherently wrong with how we're doing business internally, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love it. Yeah, I think uh, any business that has an average uh, churn rate of twenty percent plus uh, annually is is probably uh, needs to look into other things they could do, right? <laughs> so that's a always that's not great. Uh, uh so, well, let's do this. So I want to zoom out a little bit here. Um, when we look at the payments industry broadly, and I know you have so many other friends and connections as well that are also payments innovators. And when you look at the the industry broadly, what are some of the big trends that you're seeing, uh, you know, innovations or trends or things that you see in the payment space that have you maybe excited, maybe worried a little bit, maybe interested? Like, what are you seeing out there, Sebastian, that interests you? Um, honestly, all, all this conversation around, um, specifically, um, B2B payments, right. I, I'm not even, we, yeah. we don't work necessarily with B2B, right. Uh, right. payments at all, but I, I, if you think about it, it's, you know, if, if B2C payments is a $7 trillion annual sales volume game, um, B2B is a $33 trillion roughly around there, right. um, in, in terms of processing volume annually. And, and the majority of this is still done through checks and, and lock boxes and, mm -hmm. and, and all these sort of antiquated tech that, you know, for the most part hasn't changed in the last, you know, half a century. Right. And, and right. to really see that push forward towards that, you know, uh, click pay or Insta or, or link to pay or ACH transfer real-time payments within that B2B segment mm -hmm. and, and really removing that friction from even, you know, as myself as a business owner, sometimes we still send checks out. Right. Yeah. And, and it's such a hassle from, oh, yeah. from, you know, from the back room, making sure that the check is drawn on time and then sent over and, Maybe there is no real safety or security issue, uh, features associated with that particular transaction. Right. But, you know, and, and now let alone the vendor who gets paid on the other end, maybe they had net 10, net 30 terms. Now your check is on route. Maybe it clears within the time period. And you're, you're looking at a 50, 60 day, maybe turnaround right. from, a, from an invoice you received. So I, I really, I'm excited for, you know, what's going on around that B2B payments transformation. Like got a couple of friends who are working within that segment. And, you know, it's very yeah. exciting to see anywhere from, you know, one click, uh, click one, one click, pay your invoice to, you know, financing or using um, right. analytics or AR machine learning to finance particular um, invoices that are coming in. And I think yeah. this is a very exciting time yeah. for industry. Um, also that, you know, obviously Apple came up with some version of this, but you've seen it around in, in yeah. pockets that, 
ability to accept payments via your mobile phone. Like I think right. that's pretty fascinating and yeah. and really a way to move forward in payments, right? Payments should be frictionless. Payments should right. be, you know, if you have something to sell, it should be relatively easy to transact. And I think this is the way we're moving forward, right? That removing those barriers and frictions around the transaction and really, really positioning technology at the core center of, of, of that evolution, right? If you, you know, if you, um, if you owned an ISO today, right, um, what would, what would scare you? What would you be looking at? Maybe not scare you, but what would you look at and say like, crap, like we, <laughs> we got to do something about this in the next three years. Like, is there any like trends that you look at like that, that are kind of, you know what I mean? Do you think the ISO should maybe be paying more attention to or anything? Is there anything like that that stands out? Um, you know, you know what the ISOs have done a very great job. It's distribution channels to really build those relationships out with the merchants, right? And right. And, and 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 don't get me wrong, there, there is no tech that's going to replace that relationship, right. human to human interaction that you build out from establishing right. that trust, right? Uh, but I do, you know, I, I do also see a lot of shifts going on in the industry where you know the ISOs where. Um, the the ISOs of yesterday may, may not survive what's coming next, right? And and this can stem from you know players like Toast emerging and really sort of cannibalizing that whole you know from product deployment all the way to the processing, right? So these players that are coming into the to the field are not coming in from a maybe a sales mentality, right? It's it's almost that tech mentality and how do we right. you know automate as much as we can? How do we eliminate you know, frictions and and, and, yeah. and that human interaction as much as possible, because that doesn't become scalable as you continue to grow over time. Right. right. Um, so I would just, you know, if, if, I, if I had an ISO, I would, you know, very much invest very heavily. And in how can I um, optimize my day to day operations while leveraging technology as much as possible to do a lot of the heavy lifting and you know yeah. um, for example in our case right i mean you you once you grow to 5000 10000 merchant portfolio it becomes very hard to have those interactions and those intimate relationships with each one of your merchants the same way you maybe did right. when you first started onboarding accounts right like right. using or leveraging a technology like ours will really allow you to sort of scale that white glove approach, right? Where maybe right. you're no longer doing it for everyone, but you're still continually, to, you're still doing that that, uh, that, that hand holding uh, because you're leveraging technology mm -hmm. to do so, right? So yeah. I, I think that's sort of where, where we shift yeah. or where we continue to evolve. It's, it's It becomes less about um, just selling you on a, you know, save you a couple of basis points, but instead expands to this almost like um, ISOs and acquirers becoming really that that advisor or third party advisor for the merchant as it relates to, you know, yeah. obviously payments processing fees, but, you know, even, hey, how can I get plugged into an omni-channel solution so I can start selling online, right? Yeah, I like it. it to me, uh, Sebastian, it's like, um, as you were talking, I was thinking of these two words, you mentioned both of them, friction and focus. It's like, you know, if I was an ISO today, which I'm not, you know, but I sold my last ISO seven years ago. But if I had an ISO today, it would be, where's the friction? And we have to remove it. And that friction could be like for the, for the, the agent, you know, for the reseller, um, you know, the, some of the, some of the application processes these agents go through that I see is just absolutely arcane. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Still um, pen and paper, you know. I mean, <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah. And, and even the and there's like, oh no, ours is on a tablet. It's like, well, if you have your 17 page DocuSign on a tablet, that doesn't count. Like that's still like the fact that they're using a smart pen instead of a real pen. It's still a pen. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that's not good. Um, so I think there's that friction, and then of course the merchant, same thing. So much friction there. Um, but also the focus, right? Because they have to focus on a lot, you know, which verticals are going to go after, like what, you know what I mean? How are we going to compete? Which, which, uh, merchants are we going to reach out to, to your point using technology like Arkham, who are we going to reach out to? Right. We can't reach out to everybody. It's like focus. They got to be able to focus the resources if they want to compete. Like you said, they can't, uh, they can't remain competitive if they're just kind of scattershot trying to do everything for everybody. Right. Because I mean, at, at the end of the day, let's be honest. I mean, even the largest organizations out there, you know, the, the Pfizer's, the global payments, like they, they still have, you know, 
trouble with allocating resources to yeah. manage their entire portfolio. You know, so you certainly have to pick and choose your battles at a certain yeah. point, right? And, and and I think that this is the point where you know technology really comes into play. Um, whether it comes from, you know, for leveraging for retention purposes, um, pricing reasons or pricing, you know, repricing that portfolio to all the way to even, you know, reacquiring merchants that might have left the portfolio, right? These are right. all techniques that are commonly used in other in other verticals out there where really facilitates or or, or streamlines that, that ability to do business with, you know, a, a, as smart as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. So here's my next question. And, and this is something I think a lot about. Um, you know, it feels to me, Sebastian, like we kind of have these two different worlds that have, you know, kind of developed on, on the one side, we have this kind of ISO agent world. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's a legacy payments world. And a lot of companies are doing great. You know, they're trying to embrace technology and all that. But, but by and large, you've got this kind of legacy world. And they are, like you mentioned earlier, so good at distribution, you know, really. And they have such great relationships with merchants and all that. Then on the other side, you have the the payfac ISV tech world that is saying, hey, wait a second, payment processing is looking pretty good. You know, let's <laughs> let's get into that. They have fantastic technology, but I consult for many of them and they struggle with distribution. They have a hard time getting getting deals, you know. And you would think that these two worlds would have kind of come together a little bit better. Uh, and, and a lot of the large acquirers are doing this, but you know, you think they'd be able to come together and say, like, hey, you've got distribution. We've got technology and vice versa. Let's work together. <clears throat> and we've seen that a little, but not as much as I thought we would. I was just curious if you have any thoughts. I mean, why, why, why are these two worlds kind of clashing more than more than partnering? Um, I, I think you're spot on. And really, if you see any collaboration um, coming in from, you know, even an ISV to a big processor, it, it comes from a, you know, uh, more of an acquisition perspective, right? I mean, right. look at Payrix, exactly. you know, look at Payrix coming into FIS. Right. And you see this picture play out time and time again, right? So, so they're they're certainly you know the big processors are are, are certainly aware of this, and 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 for them the way to to move to to you know move forward from there is you know to try to acquire as many ISVs as they can, and and you sort of have seen this right. big or, or 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 huge drive towards hey you're an ISV or a payback like, work with us, right? Right. Um, but but I think that the big divide. Essentially comes from you know you you you're you're approaching this particular you know um, call it a problem or opportunity from different lenses right uh, from an ISO traditional ISO the, these are sales organizations right which right. which require or or rely on hey you know I go out and start knocking on doors maybe pick up the phone and start dialing numbers to really acquire as many accounts as you can um, and, and these are you know, based on sort of the, that old school, you know, relationship, establishing trust, coming into the store physically, right? Um, which is a very different philosophy that that tech companies operate in, right? The, the mm -hmm. ethos of a tech company is how do I eliminate that human element out so I can streamline my operations as efficiently as possible and scale quickly, right? Right. And, and, and at times those two approaches are at odds with one another. Right. And, and and even from, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I experienced this significantly when I first got into the industry. It's um, I, I have this sort of, you know, great idea. I know that everyone's going to buy because, hey, everyone has an it's attrition be so problem. And is, yeah. I, and, 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 and I realized <laughs> that maybe for the first year and a half, I was so focused on our tech. And every time we had a conversation with someone, it's like, oh, yeah, we have a 90 percent accuracy rate within a 12 month period and all these other, you know, Essentially, and yeah, right stats that I cared about because I was deeply involved with the development of this product. Right, but someone from a sales organization doesn't really care about what my accuracy rate is. Doesn't really care how many merchants I'm able to predict on a monthly basis. All he cares about is what does this mean to my bottom line. Right, right, and, and how are my residuals going to be protected if I make this investment of you right. know five dollars per merchant? Right, what what is this going to yield me? Right. So so it's First of all, very hard to have a conversation is kind of like, you know, maybe throwing politics a little bit in here, right? When, when you have a, a, an extreme right and an extreme left person in the same room, you can't even have a discussion that even though we don't philosophically agree with where we're coming from, you know, at the very least, we should be able to find some common ground, right? Right. right. I think that's what's 
sort of playing out in payments as well, where, you know, the, the tech players feel like, I, I don't need to talk to the ISOs and the ISOs feel like, hey, uh, these tech players are, you know, essentially competing for for right. my piece of the pie. Right, exactly. So you know, rather than seeing it as, hey, this is a huge opportunity for the two of us, I, I think that, you know, yeah. seeing each other as, you know, essentially competitors really, 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 drives that continues to drive that day by forward, which, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer that, Hey, uh, if both parties come together to the, you know, to the table, I think that everyone would benefit, right. It's not right. a zero sum game. I think that um, yeah. ISVs working along with ISOs and processors can really prosper in, in a world where, you know, personalization and, and access to solutions that are specific to my store or my business are really important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree. I think one thing that's that's actually surprised me. I think the last twelve months, as I've been as I've had the opportunity to work more with on the on the tech side, right? <clears throat> um, you know, my assumption was always that all the ISVs and the the tech companies they all would love to work with the ISOs. It's just that the ISOs are so stubborn they don't want to embrace <laughs> technology. Well, that's actually not the case. Like, actually, like it's a better a better uh, illustration of it would be the far left and the far right. It's it's like a lot of the tech companies. It's like Oh, I would never. What do you mean? I, I would never work with an independent sales organization. I don't want what 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 is that salespeople? Even? Yeah, the other what is that is. even? You know, it, it's it, it's that. Yeah. I mean, I, you have to understand. Like a lot of these people are coming to payments, right? Uh, right. Not from a payments angle, but rather, hey, I spotted a problem. I'm right. building a solution to solve this problem, and and payments just happens to be a core function of right. that solution, right? So yep. I I think that even you know. Outside of payments organizations, like if you ask someone in the streets, like, oh, do you, what, what's an ISO? Most right. people look at you like, what are you talking about? Right. You, right. Of course. Yeah. So. Well, I think I think the other thing that's interesting, Sebastian, is um, where we're at with it now, I find so intriguing because today, if you went to most ISOs, you know, and said, are you embracing technology and, you know, and everything? It was, oh, of course, because we offer Clover, we offer Zusa, we offer, you know, these 17 different point of sale systems. And we offer the Valor suite and the Deja Vu suite and the, you know, like, and it's like, well, no, but I'm saying, are you like partnered with technology? Like, is it a core part of your operation? Like, how are you now changing the sales process to embrace these systems? And how do your salespeople know which system to sell to which vertical? And what type of marketing materials are you producing for that vertical that explain that solution in a way that, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I come into these conversations and I'm always, it's always like so interesting to me because, you know, five years ago, all my conversations were with ISOs uh, in terms of like, Hey, you have to embrace technology. You know, now I feel like most of my conversations are, let me explain what I mean by embracing technology. I don't mean that you have a loose, you know, relationship of some kind with lots of technology companies that your agents don't understand, but they can offer. It's like, there's a little bit more to it than that, you know? So, um, all right. One more question. A couple of ones I want to throw at you. So let's talk about data for a second. Ultimately, the payments industry, you know, one of the big things we have is lots of data, as, as I, I know you're a, an expert in. And you primarily have a tech play on, on data. You're using this data to predict uh, attrition and things like that. How do you see this going over the next kind of 12 to 36 months? Um, you know, is there are there going to be a lot of additional plays on on payments data? What innovations have you excited there? <clears throat> and how do you see Arkham kind of developing as well in, in the way that you're using data to add value to the ISO agent world? Um, that's a great question. And, and and to be honest, you know, I I'm excited for the next 12, 36 months ahead because, you know, even when you're fully ingrained in one specific issue or one specific use case, you know, sometimes right. you get a bone thrown your way, for example, yeah. you know, and now we're exploring, you know, from, you know, com complete left field that came to us, you know, we're, we're pitching this financial services company and they said, well, we don't really are not really interested in, in predicting our, you know, what accounts are leaving our merchant acquiring book, but we're very interested in seeing we can apply this to our depositors and savings accounts. Um, they're a you know a regional community right, bank, sure. yeah. and, and all of a sudden it's like th this light bulb comes in and says, "Wow, you know, we, we bank with SBB when when the whole fiasco of them going under." Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. So so I didn't know that. so so, so, so I have gotten sort of a, a <laughs> glimpse into what a bank run feels like and being at the other end of one, right? Right. Um. So I realized all of a sudden it's like, wow, for for the next foreseeable future, every financial institution that is not Chase, 
uh, Bank of America, City, or Wells is going to be looking at because this is a potential right. existential crisis for them. You, you lose depositors, you lose your ability to loan out funds, and you lose your ability yeah. to operate as a bank, right? Because there is no without depositors, there is nothing to lend out, right? Right. Uh, so, so obviously, the emergence of of of, of different use cases. Mm. Um, um, uh, within the same, you know, w within our vertical, and at the same time, even you know, the same data set that we use to um, predict who's likely to be switching over to your competitor, it's the same data that we can use to help you out with better pricing strategies. Even you know, helping you identify what merchants have a highest likelihood to be reacquired um, that had previously been processing with you, right? So fr yeah. from we can go. We, we can go deep or wide, right? We can go deeper in terms of solving additional issues or helping ISOs uh, become um, become um, able to leverage this data better, right? right. And, and at the same time, we can go wider in terms of exploring other use cases within the financial services vertical, right? Sure. Um, in terms of what has me excited, I obviously AI is the big talk around, you know, everywhere, right? It, yeah, it's, of course. It, it, yeah, with, with open AI, it's really been transformational of what they have been able to do and accomplish in such a short amount of time. Um, I don't think we nearly talk about this enough in our, you know, in our yeah. industry. In fact, you know, um, you, you were at Transact, right? There, there yep. was one conversation around AI and, and this was on Wednesday morning. Right. So right. so obviously it's not front and center in our conversation. And, and this is something that, you know, use cases have been, you know, we've been leveraging AI in our industry for decades already. Right. When right. look at companies like Feature Space out of here of Atlanta, Feedside that leverage AI and machine learning models to detect and combat fraud. Right. Yep. Right? Um, in, in our case, we're leveraging machine learning to help ISOs combat churn. Um but I do this. I do see this marriage between, you know, uh, natural language processing models, right, or or, right. or what we call, you know, AI. What you see maybe present in, in ChatGPT, really making a a an, an appearance into our industry, whether it's in the form of support, right? Uh, so yep. th those support call volumes maybe could be mitigated through, you know, having a first line of defense being on AI chatbot. Right. Right. Um, or at the same time, at least in, in, in our specific um, uh, business, we're thinking about using it for to help the retention manager um, create that content that's going out to that merchant that was flagged to be at risk of leaving. Right. So yep. one of the questions we got, you know, probably, you know, when we first initially got started is, well, the, this is really good. I know exactly who's going to leave. I don't know why they're leaving, but but what should I do with this information, right? right and, exactly. and for us, for us, it was like, hey, James, this is your portfolio. I mean, you uh, got to reach out. You got to do your right. Thing. You, you know yeah. best. You know, you know right. best. You're the one who onboarded this account. Right. Um, but we're really seeing that instead of, you know, leaving that up to the client, really providing them with the right framework and tools to potentially predict who's likely to turn why they're likely to turn and here is a template you know whether it's depending on the channel is this an email template or is this a call yep. template or a right. call script that will go directly to that merchant once you click send right so really yep. taking care of that end-to-end -end sort of solution that we always envision around you know churn mitigation right where it's not only do we provide you with the analysis to identify who needs to be contacted but also here's the content Right. to that you're going to use to yep. leverage and, and contact that merchant to maximize your likelihood or probability of saving that account right so yep. uh, I'm, I'm very excited with you know obviously you know what's going on around the ai space obviously i'm a little biased in that front but i, I think that we're not haven't even scratched the surface of right. what's possible especially as we marry these you know sort of complex um ai models with obviously the the the, the data we have available as an industry right yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, I had actually on my list of questions <clears throat> to ask you about ChatGPT and how you might be using it because <laughs> um, it's funny, like, uh, you know, I think within a couple of months, I think the team member, and I have a lot of employees, and I think the the team member that I'll be talking the most to on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be ChatGPT. Um, <laughs> I would say it's already definitely top three or four, uh, you know, and now they, they just rolled out the app, uh, the iOS app. So I have it on my phone. It's like the the on my home screen. It's like <laughs> Chat GPT is in that spot that you click the most because 
all throughout the day I use it. Um, but I, I think, you know, what's super interesting about it right now is there's so much potential for it down the road, of course, um, in the payments industry, but right now there's so much real practical value, yep. right. That you can get from it. And I think, I think people don't understand. I mean, like I'm launch. there's a new, a new thing I'm launching. I can't talk about yet, but I'm launching in the fall and, uh, the brand name for it and the, the, the kind of slogan, all that stuff. I you developed, Chad GPT, huh? I, I developed <laughs> it with Chad GPT. Now, you know, it wasn't like it told me exactly what to do, but it was like, it gave me the options. I was able to narrow it down further and come up with a good brand name that I liked. Um, and you know, uh, just the other day, the reason that one of the reasons I wanted to ask you about it is because two days ago I had a meeting or on Friday, I had a meeting with my developers and we were talking about, cause we have a lot of things we do on the statement analysis side and all of that, where we use a lot of AI stuff to, to get the data and all that. But kind of like you, one of our issues is always, well, how do we explain, you know, the analysis to the person, you know, a lot right. of times they don't understand. And our issue was like, oh, well, ChatGPT is not actually great at that. Like we we tried it and it was like, eh, it doesn't know that much. Well, then the API came out where you can train ChatGPT with your own data. With your own data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, so we literally are like in the baby stages of of doing that. And we're going to be like feeding and everything to, to train it. And I think there's such a huge opportunity there. You know, when you marry that together with, say, some of the stuff that Google has going on in terms of the uh, voice Right where you they can they can make the voice sound like you know you give it the stuff to say and it can it sounds like you're talking to a real human being. I mean, support is going to get really interesting and the, very cost deep, effective. The, even the deep fakes you're seeing around there with you know I, I like James Shepard. There's probably a video of you somewhere there where you really I, didn't. I make didn't that do that. Video, yeah, I right? know. So. Yeah, it's well, like I'll, one other one I'll tell you that I think is super interesting. So as an example for those that maybe aren't as familiar to understand some of the practical implications. So for years, I've been talking about doing show notes for the podcast, right? Um, where, you know, like a big, long document that's got like, here's what we talked about. It's got graphics and the whole thing. Well, we keep talking about it. I, there's a couple different companies that would have done it for three, $4,000 a month. You know what I mean? Because it's very time consuming to like, yeah. you know, take a 45 minute episode and make show notes out of it. Um, well, we finally solved the problem. We're going to have it coming out here in a couple of weeks. And what we did is we used Otter, which is one AI. Yeah, yeah. Yep. To to grab the the uh the context from the Zoom, you know, to get the 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 uh you know script. Um, then we take the script from the podcast, dump it into Chat GPT four, and say type out a fifteen hundred word show notes article, which it types out. Then we use um, Adobe Firefly, which is the uh, creative AI, and we say read this article and produce the graphics that we need to put <laughs> in there. And this whole process takes us like ten minutes. Yeah. And we have our show notes. So my my uh, marketing director <clears throat> takes ten minutes a week to make the show notes. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that. I just feel like that's like a that's like saving us thousands of dollars a month and dramatically increasing the value of what we're already doing. So um, I don't know about you. I'm just super excited to kind of see like where does this go? This is going to be scary, but it's I think it's fun. It's like exciting, you know. Yeah, uh, let me ask you, James. How how long did it take you to come up with those show notes before? Well, we never did it because like, so what happened was one time I tried to do it and I had one person who took about, I think something like three hours to type up the notes, maybe four, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then we had a different person. Cause you can't just, you can't just publish the, uh, like, you know what I mean? The, the transcript, transcript, the actual transcript. Like, right, no right, good, right. You know? yeah. So then I had somebody else try to rewrite it and they get like, they worked on it for like three days. And they were like, and then I got it back and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. But I need to like edit it. I don't have time to edit this enormous document. Yeah. Right. And then my team was like, hey, if we had graphics and like, oh, yeah, that'd take us a day. I mean, it was literally like a week of work that yeah. we can do now in 10 minutes for yeah. I think the combined subscription is like less than $100 for all of the things that we're using to do it, like $100 a month. And, and that's really what it is, right? It's a yeah. productivity booster for, you know, now all of a sudden, even if you're, you know, a one man show, right? All of a sudden right. you can leverage all these tech to essentially have your own copywriter, your own design team. And, yeah. and, and, and really all these solutions are fresh out of a box, right? Like right. you don't have to be trained in AI and, and, right. and understand no. No. The complex models. It's like plug and play and, yeah. and you're ready to go. Right. And, and, yeah. and I think that's where, you know, this really starts, you know, accelerating sort of what we're able to do because, you know, 
uh, things like, you know, what you that process you just described, even, you know, support where it becomes so important within our industry and having the ability to, you know, answer support calls in a short amount of time, not providing that one in hundred right. number uh, really become key to fostering those healthy relationships. Right. So I, I really, you know, I, I am very excited. I, you know, obviously, you know, you always have your doom and glooms, you know, yeah, people, whenever new tech comes around, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, of course. I'm obviously, you know, very excited to, you know, what's to come next and and really seeing the prolification of this technology into the payments industry, where, again, uh, this is a data driven industry. You know, uh, yep. the things that we can do once we start training some of these models with some of this transaction data, I think that it's going to be very exciting. I mean, yeah. even whether it, you know, maybe downstreaming insights directly to the merchant as it relates to maybe helping them forecast or future, you know, interchange fees, right? Or right. maybe helping right. them forecast um, or identify those seasonal patterns that are going to come within their business because we have seen them for the past right. three years since that merchant started processing with us, right? So right. I really think that in from like ISOs and acquires and process will get smarter in the sense that how much information they provide to their merchants or the end user in helping them, you know, generate more sales volume, grow their business because everyone yeah. benefits from that, right? The, the, if, if you're an ISO and what is your number one, you know, incentive, obviously to, to, to have as many merchants process with you, but also to have these merchants the to continually grow over yeah. time. So you can also grow your residual base, right? So yeah. I think, I think that we, yeah, I think we haven't seen, you know, we're only seeing the beginning. Oh, very, very beginning. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and I was, I always like to remind people as well. It's like, you know, you have to, you have to understand if you're, are you a rule maker or are you a game player? You know, and when it comes to all this AI and all this debate, I mean, unless you ha are in the Senate or in Congress right now, you're a game player. You're not a rule maker. So the rules are what they are right now. Yep. Take advantage right? And, and innovate and, you know, embrace these things. Don't be like, oh, I'm so scared of AI. No, no, well, you got to embrace it. Are there going to be regulations down the road? I hope so. Hopefully they're going to regulate this stuff, uh, you know, pretty quickly, but you know, that's all going to come and the rules will change. And then we have to adapt to the rules, but we're game players. We're not rule makers. And so we got to play the game and try to win based on the rules that we, the, the current reality that we face. So Sebastian, it's always so fascinating having these conversations with you. I had other questions, but we're, we're going to have to skip out on those, have another episode. But uh, before we go, um, tell everybody real quick where they can go to learn more about you and about Arkham if they want to dramatically reduce attrition. Um, absolutely. Well, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I, you know, sometimes put some content out there in forms of articles, trying to really, you know, not necessarily educate the industry, but really showcase what's you know, what's possible in terms of, I don't really, I don't really care whether you leverage our tech or not, right? But for you to be aware that your churn rates are not fixed and right. they could be reduced over time and that you can really engage in these proactive retention measures, right? Mm -hmm. Really, you know, drives the industry forward at the end of the day, whether it's us doing the analysis or your in own internal team or maybe a consulting firm. But but this is all about you know putting service at the front for at, at the front and center of the payments conversation, right? I yep. I think that most recently that you know JD Power's you know recent survey came out and they showed hey uh, merchants are really really taking service seriously, right? And and they're expecting more from their providers and and we see it all the time in terms of the accounts we flag, right? So um, helping ISOs you know really reduce that voluntary attrition it's you know it's it's our it's our, it's our calling right and yeah not to sound too you know exoteric out there but but it's, it's really you know why we wake up and and decided hey uh, this is a tough problem let's go out and solve it yeah. um because there's obviously you know significant you know upside in terms of having a positive impact in the industry uh, that we can do so um cool. pretty active on linkedin and you know obviously our website arkham.ai um feel free to, you know, leave a message or essentially book some time with us. Awesome. So that's uh, Sebastian. Last name is Biles. It's B-U-I-L-E-S, right? Did I spell that right? Yeah, that is correct. That is How correct. How about that? Pronoun First try. Didn't even, hey, yeah. Maybe we can work on your pronunciation, but that, that the spelling does the <laughs> job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got one of the two. I mean, I'm getting there. So. <laughs> Uh, so look up, look up Sebastian on LinkedIn. Check out Arkham.ai. Sebastian, always such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Wishing you great success in the next year ahead. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Hey, likewise, James. Take care. Always great to be here.
Today's episode is brought to you by CC Sales Pro Consulting. If you are an ISO uh, and you are looking to grow or scale your business, if you are a fintech company, a payfac, an ISV, and you're looking to grow distribution or understand the payments industry better, uh, you can just reach out to me directly, james at ccsalespro.com. My team will intercept those emails, reach out, and see if it's a good fit for you and I to have a conversation together. So people ask me all the time, James, what do you do with your consulting practice? And the answer is actually very simple. I pretty much do the same thing for every company. Um, what I do is I establish an objective, which is almost always to increase the number of new mids per month. And then we talk about how best to do that. And I'm able to leverage my creative team to create custom video content. Uh, we have our publications for advertising. Uh, we have all these different things, but we also have the consulting side where I have a huge library of documents that I've created for companies on how to you know, uh, recruit, train, manage, activate uh, agents in this industry, whether it's inside sales, selling technology, outside W2, outside 1099, local team, national team, work with all of those. So if you're serious about growing your team and you'd like to personally work with me in order to do that and have at your disposal my entire team and all of their expertise on payment processing, statement analysis, content creation, marketing, recruiting, et cetera, et cetera, and you'd like to learn more about our consulting practice, just shoot me an email directly, james at ccsalespro.com. Again, it will get filtered out, um, but it'll be intercepted by my team and they'll reach out and find out if it's a good fit. So my name is James Shepard. This episode is brought to you by CC Sales Pro Consulting. Now let's dive into this really cool questions from the field about chat GPT. Hey everybody, and questions from the field today, I'm gonna answer the question of how could an ISO or an agent use chat GPT to grow their portfolio. Now, for those of you that are listening, uh, rather than watching the YouTube video version of this one, I'm gonna talk you through this so you'll be able to understand, I think, most of it. <clears throat> but for the rest of you, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I have ChatGPT4 pulled up. Um, so I wanted to walk you through a couple of things. For those of you that are a little bit uh, you know, new to this concept, I have been uh, using ChatGPT since the day it came out, and I love it. Um, make sure that you have the paid version, first of all. I think it's still 20 bucks a month right now. Otherwise, when you type stuff in, it takes quite a while to get a response back. I can assure you, you will get $20 worth of value like the day that you get it. Um, so I wanted to just run through a couple of things real quick that you can do to use ChatGPT to grow your book of business. Number one on my list is to understand specific business types, okay? Now, remember, ChatGPT is on your phone now. So if you have an iOS, I don't think they have the Android one yet. I, I use an iPhone and they have it live there. But um, for these, uh, you know, for these situations, let's say that I'm walking into, um, oh, let's say I'm walking into a small transmission shop. And maybe I don't really think too much about that. Well, I could type out to ChatGPT and say, give me... Uh, two paragraphs on the challenges facing small transmission shops in the U.S. market and specifically around how they accept payments. And we'll just go with that. All right. So I will read you. And again, I have never done this. Is the first time I've ever done this one. I'm just going to literally read you exactly what ChatGPT has typed out. Now, one thing to keep in mind while, while ChatGPT is generating this response, um, remember that ChatGPT, the data in it is uh, started four years ago uh, and, and backwards. In other words, they don't have information for the last four years. So be careful about asking about trends from the last, you know, four years. And also remember, of course, it can be inaccurate and, you know, uh, you can get some crazy information. So let me just read you what was uh, what was given here. Small transmission shops in the U.S. market face several challenges. On one hand, market competition is fierce as they have to vie with not, not just other small businesses, but also with major franchise auto repair shops and dealerships, which typically have broader service offerings and more marketing resources and larger customer bases. Technological advancements are another major hurdle. As the automotive industry shifts towards electric uh, and self-driving cars, the technology required for servicing these vehicles, including their transmission systems, becomes more sophisticated. I didn't even think of that before, right? So they might be thinking about, wow, this transition to self-driving cars and all that, what's that going to do for them? Um, <clears throat> smaller shops often struggle to keep up with these changes due to limited resources and the expense involved in acquiring and maintaining new equipment and training staff on new techniques. Specifically around payment acceptance, small transmission shops face the challenges of staying up to date with emerging payment technologies. Many consumers now prefer cashless transactions utilizing digital wallets, 
online payments and card-based transactions, which require businesses to have secure, reliable payment processing. On top of that, these systems often entail additional costs for transaction fees, equipment, and cybersecurity measures. Um, the technical aspects of integrating these payment systems into their existing infrastructure can be complex and time-consuming. There's the issue of maintaining customer trust when handling sensitive financial information. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this is interesting, right? So I just took a minute and I read this before I go into a transmission shop. What does this do for me? Well, it puts me in a different mindset, right? I'm all of a sudden thinking about, oh yeah, if I was a transmission shop owner, I would be thinking about changes, you know, like, and, I, and that's a great way to start that conversation. I might even go in and just say, hey, I'm a local business owner here. And uh, I'm just curious, I mean, how's it going for you guys? Like, you know, what? how do you think this transition is going to go to more of the electric cars, self-driving cars? Like, how are you thinking about that? It just gives me things to talk about and it gives me ideas, right? Now, one of the other cool things about ChatGPT here is I can continue this conversation, right? And so I could say things like more specific. I could say like, what is the average transaction size for a transmission shop? Okay. And uh, let's see what they give us with that. Uh, let's see. It's going to vary greatly. Um, <laughs> it says, as my knowledge cuts off as of September of 2021, um, but it gives me a range of $1,800 to $3,500. And in some cases, it can go even higher, especially for complex problems or high-end vehicles. Okay. So again, um, this is information for me, right? Is it going to be totally 100% accurate? No, but it's like, oh, wow, transmission shops. I wasn't thinking their transactions were going to be quite that big. So number one is learn about specific verticals in the field in real time as you're out prospecting to get yourself in the right mindset to have those conversations. Number two, create marketing materials for specific verticals. I've talked a lot about this on the podcast where, hey, we want to, you know, we really want to make marketing materials that are more specific to the vertical, right? Well, what if I decided to go to all the transmission shops? Okay. So I'm going to say here, um, I'm going to tell chat, G, chat GPT, write me a marketing email that is designed for these transmission shops and highlights my point of sale and payment processing solutions that provide email invoicing, um, let's see here, and other contactless payment technologies that allow these small operators to give their customers more payment options and get paid faster. So <clears throat> I'm going to let this uh, generate here. Now, I'm not going to read the entire thing because it would take too long. Um, but if you have not ever messed with ChatGPT before, you would be blown away by how good uh, it is at this kind of thing. So I'll read a little bit of it and then we'll move on to the, the last one, the third one. So subject, boost your business and get paid faster with our advanced payment solutions. I will say I'm not crazy about ChatGPT's subject lines for emails. They usually are a little too vague. Um, and here I would definitely want to include transmission shops in this. But anyway. All right, so here we go. <laughs> Dear recipient name, I hope this message finds you well. My name is your name, and I'm with your company. I am uh, a leading provider of point of sale solutions. I understand that in the rapidly evolving automotive industry, your transmission shop faces unique challenges. Competition is fierce, technology is advancing, and customers are looking for convenience like never before. That's why we designed our cutting edge point of sale and payment solutions to help you stay ahead of the curve. Our platform enables you to offer your customers a wide array of payment options, including digital wallets, online payments, and card-based transactions. In today's cashless society, customers appreciate and expect flexibility in payment methods, and we help you deliver that with ease, and on and on it goes. Now, that is pretty good, and I'm somebody that's pretty good at writing marketing emails. That's a pretty good marketing email. You know, certainly you would want to edit it, obviously. You know, think of ChatGPT not as taking over your job, just making it a lot faster. So it might take you two hours to come up with a great marketing email, whereas when you use ChatGPT, it might take you 20 minutes because let them do the first draft. Or I'll tell you what's even better, and this might surprise you actually, is a great way to use ChatGPT. I have actually found that ChatGPT is much better at doing the second, third draft. So what I'll do is um, if I am trying to write a marketing email or, or a document of some kind, I will go and write the document myself because I want to have all the specifics in there, okay? And then I will literally just paste it into chat GPT-4 and say, make this sound better. <laughs> like literally, right? Now, 
one thing you'll find with ChatGPT is the more specifics that you give, um, then the better the results is going to be. So if you can give more information and say things like, hey, um, ChatGPT, uh, don't change too much of this. Just correct the spelling and grammar and make it sound a little better. I'd also like it to be a little bit shorter, you know, something like that. Um, or you could say whatever you want. I mean, you could say, um, make this sound simpler um, and it will do that. Um, one of the things, if you want to see the real power of chat GPT, that'll blow your mind and, and make sure you don't show your, uh, your kids this, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just getting there, but anyway, you could, you could show and say, go in there and say, um, say, write me a two paragraph document on the revolutionary war. Okay. And then once you're done with that, say now write that same document in the language of a fifth grader, it will rewrite that document to sound like something a fifth grader would write. You know, George Washington was super cool, you know, or whatever. It's amazing. It's incredible. So it's very, very good at things like that. So there's number two is to write these marketing specific, uh, you know, documents. Number three is become more active on social media. Okay. Become more active on social media. So a lot of people are nervous about posting on social media. They don't want to sound the wrong way. They don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, and there's several really cool things you can do with chat GPT for if you're a little bit more hesitant to be on social media. One of the best things is just tell chat GPT exactly what you want. Let's say we're going to make a, a, a tweet. And so we want it something that is that's short, right? And we could say, um, you know, you could literally, one thing I found really cool is you can literally paste in the entire article that you want to share. So let's say you found a really interesting news article and you want to share it on LinkedIn even. You could say, um, you know, give me a short, uh, you know, three sentence post to promote this article. And ChatGPT is fantastic at that. And remember, it's a conversation. So if it says something, you're like, oh, I don't really like that. You can say, okay, try that again. And this time make it sound more like this, you know, and, and they'll do that. Um, but to give you an example of it real quick, I could say, um, write me a great LinkedIn post that promotes um, payment processing solutions for hair salons that integrates with a point of sale system for online appointment scheduling. Now, again, I'm trying to do this quickly because of the, the time constraints of the podcast. Normally I would give chat GPT a lot more context because the more context it's is going to do better and better. Okay. I will read you the post for those of you that are watching here. You can, you can see it calling all hair salon owners and stylists in today's digital age. Seamless customer experiences are not just nice to have. They're essential. We at XYZ company are excited to introduce our integrated point of sale and payment processing solution designed with you and your unique needs in mind. Why juggle multiple systems when you can manage everything in one place? Our innovative platform integrates payment processing with online appointment scheduling, giving you the freedom to focus on what you do best, creating fabulous hairstyles. With our integrated system, your customers can book their appointments online at their convenience. No more missed calls or late night text exchanges. Once they step into your salon, our fast and secure payment processing solution enables them to pay effortlessly using their preferred method. No more fumbling around with cash or waiting for car transactions to go through and on and on it goes. That's a really fantastic post, <laughs> right? So become more active and, and it actually even gives you, uh, it already has in here um, hashtags at the bottom, hashtag hair salon, hashtag payment solutions, hashtag appointment scheduling, hashtag business efficiency, and hashtag customer experience, hashtag POS. <laughs> like that is fantastic. Obviously you want to read it, you want to customize it, you want to edit it, but this is the sort of thing that can really help many of you to get over your fear of posting on social media for your company. So I just wanted to share a little bit of value with all of you today about using ChatGPT. I will be sharing a lot more down the road. We're doing a lot of really cool stuff with the API and all of that. And so there's a lot of like more advanced things that can be done. But I want to show you just some really practical stuff that you can use ChatGPT for. Uh, the most important thing I will tell you is if you are not using it, you are literally falling behind by the minute, <laughs> okay? Because other people are going to use this and it's just going to be so much more efficient for them. So head over to openai.com. It's O. OPENAI.com. Sign up for ChatGPT Plus and make sure you download the app for your iPhone. If you got one, and I think Android will be coming really soon. So thanks, everybody. Hopefully, you have a lot of fun with ChatGPT this week. Bye.